Good evening aspirants. Welcome to the Hindi News Analysis by Shankar IAS Academy. Displayed are the news articles chosen for today's analysis along with the page numbers of Chennai, Bengaluru, Delhi and Tiruvannathapuram editions. The link for the handwritten notes in the PDF format and the time stamping for the displayed articles is provided in the description box below. And for the benefit of smartphone users, the time stamping is also provided in the comment section. Let's move on to the first article discussion. This article discussion is about the UN AIDS. The discussion can be linked to the highlighted areas in the prelims and main syllabus which has been provided for your reference. The author of this editorial is a former health secretary of government of India. The author discusses about the fate of UN AIDS. First know that the joint United Nations program on HIV or AIDS is commonly known as UN AIDS. It was launched in the year 1996 to strengthen the way in which the UN was re responding to AIDS. It brings together the experience and expertise of 11 uh, United Nations system co-sponsors. They are United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, then United Nations Children's Fund, then World Bank, United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, then United Nations Entity for Gender Equality and the Empowerment of Women, which is uh, known as UN Women, and then United Nations Development Program, then uh, United Nations Populations Fund, which in short is known as UNFPA, and then World Health Organization, then World Food Program, then United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, and then finally International Labour Organization. Now also know that UN AIDS is the only United Nations entity that has representation of civil society in its governing body. This UN AIDS is a problem solver. It places people living with HIV and people affected by the virus at the decision making table and it also places them at the center of designing, delivering and monitoring of the AIDS response. It charts or tabulates paths for countries and communities to end AIDS. UN AIDS provides the strategic direction, advocacy and coordination and technical support. These supports are needed to catalyze and connect leadership from governments, private sector and communities to deliver the life-saving HIV services. The vision of UN AIDS is to achieve zero new HIV infections, zero discrimination and zero AIDS related deaths and also achieving the principle of leaving no one behind. Currently, UN AIDS is working towards ensuring that by 2020, 30 million people should have access to treatment through meeting the 90-90-90 targets. So what is this 90-90-90 targets? It is 90% of people living with HIV should know their HIV status. Then 90% of people who know their HIV positive status are accessing treatment. And then 90% of people on treatment have suppressed viral loads. That is their virus should have been suppressed. Now coming to the editorial discussion, the author says that this uh, joint United Nations program on AIDS is facing one of the worst challenges. The challenge is afflicting or it is bothering the global AIDS response. This is because the UN AIDS is facing an existential threat as many are questioning the relevance of UN AIDS for the global response on AIDS. This is because before 1996, AIDS belonged to the World Health Organization. The author states that there are suggestions that AIDS should go back to the World Health Organization where it originally belonged and the UN AIDS should be dissolved. Now in this editorial, the author has mentioned that in 1994, UN AIDS was established. But earlier we saw that UN AIDS was launched in 1996. Don't get confused. It is because the UN Organization and the Economic and Social Council, that is ECOSOC of the United Nations, endorsed or declared the establishment of UN AIDS in 1994 through a resolution. That is what the author is mentioning. But it was officially launched in 1996 only. Then the author notes that UN AIDS has been able to successfully mobilize, that is it prepared and organized the world opinion on HIV AIDS. This mobilization resulted in an exceptional response to the HIV AIDS epidemic. Epidemic means a widespread occurrence of an infectious disease in a community at a particular time. We are saying as HIV AIDS epidemic because 35 million people have died from AIDS related illness so far 
and still no effective treatment or cure is available nor has such a treatment or cure have been invented so far for HIV AIDS. But the United Nations and the global communities have taken many steps to eliminate HIV and AIDS. One such effort by United Nations was the political resolution or declaration which was adopted by the United Nations General Assembly special session in which is in short known as UNGASS. This political declaration was adopted in the year 2001 because in 2001 AIDS posed a global threat to health, economies and security of the nations which resulted in the adoption of the first declaration of commitment on HIV AIDS global crisis, global action. This declaration consolidated the global AIDS community behind a series of clearly defined commitments for the following five years, that is from 2001. The author says this declaration was a game changer as the declaration contained main priorities such as to ensure that people everywhere, particularly young people everywhere, to know what to do to avoid the HIV AIDS infection then to stop all forms of HIV transmission from mother to child. Then another priority was to provide treatment to all who are infected, etc. This political declaration helped to have a global response on HIV AIDS from the member nations. The next effort by the global communities was the creation of a global fund to fight AIDS, tuberculosis and malaria, which in short is known as GFATM and it was created in the year 2002. It is a partnership of governments, civil society, technical agencies, the private sector and the people affected by the diseases of AIDS, tuberculosis and malaria. It raises world's money, manages world's money and invests this world's money to respond to the three of the deadliest infectious diseases which the world has ever known. The mission of the Global Fund is to invest the world's money to defeat these three diseases. So, the Global Fund pools or accumulates world's resources. The world's resources are then strategically invested in programs that aim to end AIDS, TB and malaria as epidemics. Then in 2001, to tackle HIV AIDS, Indian generics that is Indian drug companies have slashed or greatly reduced the prices of AIDS drugs. This has enabled many countries to afford the HIV AIDS treatment. Because of the above mentioned efforts, today some 22 million people are under antiretroviral therapy. Now know that a standard antiretroviral therapy consists of the combination of at least three antiretroviral drugs. This is to suppress the HIV virus to a maximum level and stop the progression of HIV disease. As 22 million people are under antiretroviral therapy, so the author says preventing the mother to child transmission of HIV has become an achievable goal by 2020. This is because UN AIDS is working with countries to meet the commitments which are enshrined in the 2016 United Nations Political Declaration on Ending AIDS. Under the Political Declaration commitments, one commitment was to eliminate HIV infections among children by 2020. This shows that the organization has provided leadership to many countries in tackling the epidemic. This leadership has helped the countries from 2001 to 2010 to halt or to stop the epidemic and also to reverse the trend. That is, the countries are successfully preventing the spread of the infection. Now, you may think UN AIDS is providing such a good leadership, then why people are suggesting to give AIDS global response back to WHO. This is because at a time when the UN AIDS should be leading the global response to end AIDS as a public health threat, rather than that, the organization started to stumble in the strategy formation itself. Firstly, the organization gave an optimistic message that the world was going to see the end of AIDS very soon. But we know and the author also feels that this is far from true. The regions such as Eastern Europe, Central Asia and West Asia are so far from reaching the goal of ending AIDS. Also, the author says that Russia is witnessing a severe epidemic among the drug users and the homosexual community. This is happening because the political leadership in many countries have thought that AIDS is no more a challenge. As the UN AIDS has declared that we are going to see the end of AIDS very soon. 
Secondly, the author says that the organization has been thinking that the AIDS epidemic can simply be treated by the antiretroviral coverage. This may be true for those who can afford the antiretroviral drug and therapy. But the organization has forgotten that AIDS affects the poor, the marginalized and criminalized communities. These communities face challenges in accessing the treatment programs such as the test and treat program which was introduced by India. Now, because of the direction by UNAIDS that antiretroviral therapy is enough to treat the disease, many national programs do not consider other prevention programs such as usage of condoms, sexual education and drug harm reduction which are important to prevent the HIV transmission. Now this has resulted in the form of unprotected sex and drug use which did not let epidemic to vanish. The author says that this thinking of UNAIDS has also stopped the funding of non-governmental organizations and community-based organizations that were working on the prevention of the disease. Thirdly, the author notes that there has been weakening of country leadership of UN AIDS in many countries that has a high prevalence of AIDS. The senior country level position in UN AIDS are held by people who do not possess the core competence about the issue. This lack of competence is hampering the constructive engagement of political leadership with UN AIDS. Because these political leadership only provides legal reforms and they only provide access to services regarding the therapy and treatment to the marginalized populations. Then as a conclusion, the author is saying that every year there are 1.7 million or 17 lakh new infections and 1 million or 10 lakh deaths are occurring every year due to HIV AIDS. We also have the commitment to end AIDS by 2030 which the author calls as ambitious, meaning it might be difficult to achieve, but it is not impossible to achieve. So, the need of the hour is a re-energized UN AIDS with a strong and fearless leadership. So, the author finally says that any thought of dissolving the organization or giving the mandate of global response of AIDS back to WHO will be having a disastrously damaging effect on the prevention of the disease. This is all about the editorial discussion. Now, let us know some facts about HIV AIDS. The human immunodeficiency virus or HIV targets the immune system. It weakens people's defense system against infections and it weakens people's defense system against some types of cancer also. As the virus destroys and impairs the functions of immune cells, the infected individuals gradually become immune deficient. Now, this immunodeficiency results in increased vulnerability to a wide range of infections, cancers and other diseases that people with healthy immune systems can fight off. Now, the most advanced stage of HIV infection is the acquired immunodeficiency syndrome that is AIDS. It can take from 2 to 15 years to develop depending on the individual. Now, this AIDS is defined by the development of certain cancers, infections or other severe clinical manifestation. Also, remember that HIV can be transmitted via the exchange of a variety of body fluids from infected individuals such as blood, breast milk, semen and vaginal secretions. And please remember that individuals cannot become infected through ordinary day-to-day -day contact such as kisses, hugging, shaking hands or sharing personal objects, food or water. With this, we have come to the end of this article discussion. The displayed practice question will be discussed in the last session. Moving on to the next article discussion, which is an editorial. The editorial discusses about the water stress that is created in India because of over usage of water resources by the thermal power plants that are located across India. The main syllabus that can be linked to this article discussion has been highlighted here for your reference. The authors of this editorial mentions that water is not only essential for human survival, but it is also essential for agriculture and industry. They mention that India consumes water more sensibly than any other nation. Because if you see, India has only 4% of the world's total renewable water resources. But India's population is 18% of the world's total population. 
So this means 18 percent of world's population consumes 4 percent of world's renewable water resources. That is why the authors are mentioning that Indians consume water in a more sensible manner. Here by renewable water resources, the author means both the surface water and the ground water. The surface water is in the form of lakes, ponds, dams, etc. Then the author mentions about India's goal of achieving 100 percent electrification throughout the country. They suggest that if India needs to achieve 100 percent electrification across the country, then India's installed power capacity needs to be doubled. It means the power generation must be doubled in India. The authors also mention that India is seeing a lot of growth in the development of renewable energy. When we say renewable energy, we mean the energy that can be naturally replenished. That is, that energy can be restored back to its original levels. Some common examples of renewable energy are uh, solar energy, wind energy, tidal energy, etc. But even though there is a growth in the renewable sector, the author mentions that coal is projected to be the backbone of electricity sector at least till the year 2030 and maybe even beyond 2030. Now, this projection is given by the authors based on a roadmap which is titled as National Energy Map for India Technology Vision 2030. This roadmap was jointly published by uh, Terry and the Office of the Principal Scientific Advisor Government of India. Now here you have to note one point that is coal is a non-renewable energy that means the energy cannot be replenished. And one more thing is that when you see the term coal in electricity sector, just remember thermal power plants because coal is primary fuel that is used in the thermal power plants which generates electricity. And if you see large amounts of water is required to generate power in the thermal power plants. Now as we saw earlier, the editorial's focus is based on water. So the authors of this editorial are stating that managing the electricity needs of India that is already dealing with water scarcity will be a challenge. So as we just saw, thermal power plants consume significant amounts of water during the electricity generation process. But if you see, most of India's thermal power plants are located in water stressed areas. That is in those areas where there is water shortage. So these water shortages have led to disruptions or disturbances in the electricity generation. And when electricity is not available, the manufacturing process of all the industries will get affected. So the authors are noting that this will lead to significant revenue loss to the Indian economy. So to reduce this water stress, the authors give some suggestions. The first suggestion is based on a notification which was issued by the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. The authors mentioned that in December 2015, the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change has issued a notification which was regarding the limits that has to be set for water consumption by thermal power plants. These rules are called as the Environment Protection Amendment Rules of 2015. But if you see as per the Environment Protection Rules which was issued in 2018, the thermal power plants can use more water than what was mentioned in 2015 rules. So the authors are mentioning that the regulations are not effective. They advise that mechanisms need to be strengthened to make these regulations more effective. Next, the authors mention that the Central Electricity Authority has released a format for thermal power plants to report on their annual water consumption. This format was released in the month of June. In the report, the thermal power plants have been asked to specify both metered usage of water and unmetered usage of water. Generally, if you see in the industries, water meters will be there to calculate the amount of water when the water is taken from a particular place. This place is called as the source and this method of utilizing the water using meters is called as the metered usage of water. Then in the report, the thermal power plants also have to mention the sources that is the places where they take water to use in the thermal power plants like uh, whether they take water from rivers, canals or sea. Then the thermal power plants have to mention the percentage of deviation from the water norms. For example, as per rules, a company is permitted to draw only 1000 liters of water. Now if the company draws more water, then there will be a deviation. So the companies have to mention the deviation in the quantity of water taken. 
along with this deviation the reasons for the deviation and the corrective measures that were taken to stop this deviation has to be reported the authors suggest that this format can further be strengthened by including other relevant in first uh, is that the thermal power plants should disclose or reveal the amount of water that had been consumed by them in the previous if this particular data is available then a baseline data for water consumption per thermal power plant can be established and we will be able to reduce the water consumption levels with a proper planning secondly the authors suggest that whatever reports that are present in the website of central electricity authority that must be added to the environment protection rules this is because there will be more transparency in the data and the rules can be easily enforced on the thermal power plants thirdly the thermal power plants should also be required to submit verifiable evidence for example like the water bills this is to support and substantiate the data that they have disclosed or shared with the government through the report this will act as a check and balance the authors tell that without this check and balance the self reporting guidelines will remain weak finally the authors suggest that whatever data that is supplied by the thermal power plants that data should be placed in the public domain when it is placed in the public domain whatever parameters that have been shared by the thermal power plants can be studied for knowing certain issues like region specific water shortages outages that is the shutdown period in the plants and also it can be used for research purposes in the future next the authors tell that section 15 of the environment protection act provides a blanket penalty that is it provides only one penalty so as per this act if a company violates any of the provisions of the act then it may have to face up to 5 years of imprisonment with or without a fine of up to 1 lakh rupees now this is along with additional daily fines for continuing the offences so we can see that this act is not having specific penalties for specific offences the authors suggest that the government should review this particular section of the act and they have to come up with specific penalties so that the government will have a nuanced that is a, they will have a balanced framework for enforcement and penalties next the authors mention that the relevant officials who are in charge of uh, enforcement in the ministry of environment forests and climate change and also the uh, officials who are in charge in the central electricity authority should be identified and their roles must be clearly defined then the authors state that the implementation of the norms should have some time bound or time based targets and the government should monitor the progress in a periodic manner so that any improvements can be made then when required now these are the suggestions that have been given by the authors in relation to the thermal power plants that way especially in the context of reducing the water stress caused by them in addition to this the authors also suggest that india should shift or move towards getting electricity from renewable energy sources so that india will be able to achieve its global climate targets but to achieve this the authors mention that some more work will be required they have particularly mentioned one area where water consumption needs to be regulated in a specific renewable energy technologies the authors have mentioned an example they tell that the ministry of new and renewable energy has taken a first step by issuing a notice to state governments this notice is regarding the reduction in the water usage for cleaning solar panels the ministry has asked the stakeholders to explore alternative mechanisms to clean the solar panels in order to ensure that solar panels remain efficient finally the authors mention that india will need to balance both the development needs and also the water stress so they state that stringent implementation of standards is required so that water can be judiciously used by the thermal power plants and along with this renewable energy needs to be promoted along with the energy efficiency so whatever suggestions that were given by the authors which we saw during the discussion will help india to balance the needs with this we have come to the end of this article discussion this practice question will be discussed in the last moving on to the next article discussion which is about over the counter drugs policy now this news article is based on an interview given by the president of organization of pharmaceutical producers of india 
the syllabus that can be linked to this article discussion has been highlighted here for your reference before getting into the article discussion let us first know about organization of pharmaceutical producers of india organization of pharmaceutical producers of india or oppa was formed as a representative body of the manufacturers in the pharmaceutical sector it is registered under the companies act of 1956 if you see this oppa represents a majority of pharmaceutical companies that are operating in the country it also includes the public sector the president of the organization of pharmaceutical producers of india has worked with the government for the past one year for providing inputs to prepare the draft of otc policy that is the draft of over the counter drug policy so now let us see why the government is planning to come up with the over the counter drug policy if you see self medication is practiced in india self medication means an individual is taking medicines without consulting the doctor when an individual is suffering from fever or a headache or stomach pain the individual will go to the medical shop and get some medicines without the doctor's prescription now this is called as over the counter drugs a survey was conducted by a healthcare company called as Librate in the year 2015. The survey was conducted among 20,000 people across 10 cities. And out of this survey sample, it was seen that at least 52% of the people practiced self-medication. In the current scenario, a well-defined regulation for over-the-counter medicines is not available. So, a regulation is very important in order to ensure the safety of the patients or the individuals who can access the over-the-counter drug. Now, the Indian government is in the process of finalizing an OTC drug policy. So, once this policy comes into place, it will bring more clarity over the access of the drugs by the people. So, the government is gathering inputs from the stakeholders in the industry to come up with a draft OTC policy. As a part of this, the president of the Organization of Pharmaceutical Producers of India has worked with the government over the past one year by providing inputs to the draft OTC policy. In this context, let us see some of the important points that are mentioned in the news article. The president of OPPI has said that all the industry experts from both India and abroad have contributed towards developing the guideline. The best practices which were followed in various countries, then the kinds of drugs that should be included in the OTC list have all been considered by him while giving his inputs to the government to prepare the draft OTC policy. Next, the president of OPPA has discussed how will an OTC policy will help a country like India. He states that when the OTC drugs are easily available in the market, then it would automatically release the government's time and resources so that the government can focus on those drugs that require stringent standards. So he mentions that reducing the government's workload is one advantage of the OTC drugs policy. The president of OPPA is substantiating or explaining this point now. He mentions that those drugs that do not have any side effects and that does not require much explanation can be classified as OTC drugs. You can see the word explanation here. Here explanation means the usage directions that are given by the pharma companies in the back of the tablet strips or it is printed over the boxes of the drugs or even it is given in a paper form which you can see in the boxes. Then he adds that these OTC drugs should be made available in the small towns as well. He mentions that many other countries have brought more products under the OTC category so that they can focus on the drugs that need to be strictly regulated by them. But one disadvantage of using this OTC medicines is the antibiotic resistance, which is caused due to the overuse or the misuse of the drugs. To know what is meant by antibiotic resistance, first you need to know what is meant by an antibiotic. An antibiotic is a drug which is meant to treat a bacterial infection. Remember, an antibiotic is a drug which is meant to treat a bacterial infection. But if people who are having viral infections, fever and uh, other related issues are taking antibiotics, then we say they are misusing the drugs. Now, this will also amount to overuse of drugs because unnecessarily an antibiotic is being consumed by the individuals. Now, because of this, whatever beneficial bacteria that is present in the gut of that individual, that will be destroyed. And also the overuse of antibiotics will cause the bacteria to resist against the effect of those drugs. So, this is what we call as antibiotic resistance. 
So the president of OPPI has mentioned that OPPI is working with the government to spread awareness about the responsible use of antibiotics. Now let us see some other advantages and disadvantages in using these over the counter drugs for self medication. First let us see the advantages. It gives the individuals more independence in taking decisions whenever they are suffering from minor illness like headache, stomach pain etc. So we can tell that they are empowered to take decisions. The next advantage is that the healthcare system can take care of other major illnesses in the needed areas since the time and the efforts in treating the minor illnesses will be drastically reduced. The next advantage is the access of the drugs that is the ability of the individuals who are suffering from minor illnesses to purchase these drugs in the nearby medical stores. Then the next advantage is that once some drugs are listed as over the counter drugs then the government can also reduce the prices of such drugs. So it will lead to low prices of over the counter drugs. Now if the prices are less this would also lead to increased access of those drugs. So now what are the disadvantages of this? We saw that using over the counter drugs happens when an individual involves in self medication that is she or he decides what illness she or he is suffering from which means they themselves diagnose but we cannot always say that this diagnosis is right so it means sometimes misdiagnosis can also happen so we can tell that misdiagnosis is one of the disadvantage in self medication next the individuals can themselves have more dosage of drugs say if you are having a heavy headache and you take two tablets then this is called as overdosage. Then at a time if an individual takes more drugs say one for headache and one for fever and one for diarrhea at the same time it can lead to drug interactions and that might bring some other health problems. So these are some of the disadvantages of using over the counter drugs for self medication. With this we have come to the end of this article discussion. Moving on to the next article discussion which is about world economic outlook. The syllabus with which the analysis of this news article can be linked is given here for your reference. Before getting into the article discussion, let us see in brief about World Economic Outlook. World Economic Outlook is published by International Monetary Fund. This publication is based on a survey which is conducted by the staff of International Monetary Fund. It is usually published twice in a year in the months of April and October. But IMF also publishes World Economic Outlook update twice a year in the months of January and July. So remember World Economic Outlook is uh, released in the months of April and October. World Economic Outlook update is released in the months of January and July. So today we will be seeing about the World Economic Outlook update that has been recently published by IMF. The basic aim of releasing this report is to provide an update of the economic development globally. That is how the economies in each country is functioning in the near term and also in the medium term. In the context of this report, the near term is the present financial year and the medium term is the next financial year which is 2020. Usually if you see in the publication the economic forecast for the present financial year and the next financial year is only given. Now let us see the news article. The article mentions that the International Monetary Fund has cut India's GDP growth forecast for the financial year 2019 to 20. In the World Economic Outlook which was published on April 2019, IMF had projected a growth rate of 7.3% for India but now it has reduced its projections to 7%. So this is a 0.3% reduction. The reason stated for the reduced projection is that the domestic demand is poor. Next the IMF has also cut India's GDP growth forecast that is its prediction in the financial year 2020-21 to 7.2%. If you see in its April publication, IMF estimated that India's growth rate would be 7.5% in the financial year 2020-21. to So this is a 0.3% reduction. The reason given for the reduction in the forecast is also the same. The IMF has said that the domestic demand is weaker than expected. If you see IMF has also reduced the GDP growth rate projections for India in the previous three reports. 
In October 2018 World Economic Outlook, IMF predicted that India's growth rate would be 7.6% in financial year 2019-20. But the growth rate was uh, reduced to 7.5% in the World Economic Outlook update which was released in January 2019. And again the projections were reduced to 7.3% which was released in April 2019. Now again the projections have been reduced to 7%. Now here the values are not that important. From this data we can see that India's growth rate is slowing down. The main reason for this uh, reduction in growth rate is the poor domestic demand. When we say poor domestic demand it means that people are not having enough purchasing power to buy the goods and services as they did earlier. Purchasing power means enough money to buy any goods or services. Of course people will be buying things. Uh, say for example before 6 months you had enough money to buy your essential items that you need for your daily usage and also some money to buy some luxury items such as a car or a bike or a watch or, or even eating in a restaurant. But now you have money to buy only essential items. Before 3 months based on the demand that is based on what you and the whole population have purchased the companies would forecast their production activity. But now if the demand has come down that is if you are not able to purchase a good or a service then we call that as poor demand. If it is happening within India then we call it as a domestic demand. Also note that this 7% GDP growth rate forecast for the financial year 2019-20 to 20 is similar to the projections which were made by Reserve Bank of India, Asian Development Bank and also the projections made by the Chief Economic Advisor to the Government of India. Now along with this IMF has also cut its forecast for world GDP growth rate also. In the April month IMF predicted that the world's growth rate would be 3.3%. Now it has predicted that the world's growth rate would be 3.2%. Similarly, the IMF has predicted that the world's growth rate would be 3.5% in the financial year 2020 to 21. Now this is all about the news article. Let us see in brief about International Monetary Fund. The International Monetary Fund was established in the year 1944. Its headquarters is located at Washington DC. The first aim of IMF is to promote international monetary cooperation. That is it aims to help the expansion and balance to growth of international trade. Next IMF assists the countries in establishing multilateral system of payments. Multilateral system means the system of payments across national borders that is between different nations. Then one another function of IMF is to make resources that is uh, money available to the members who are having difficulties in balance of payments. Balance of payments is a statement which records the monetary transactions made between residents of a country and the rest of the world. So a country's balance of payments uh, tells you whether it saves enough to pay for its imports. If there is no money or very less money then the IMF will arrange enough resources. So it will sign a bailout package with those countries that are suffering from balance of payment problems. So that money will be given with certain tough conditions and this will help that country to bail out or revive their economy from crisis. A recent example for this is the country of Pakistan where IMF signed a bailout package of 6 billion US dollars with Pakistan. With this we have come to the end of this article discussion. The displayed practice question will be discussed in the next session. Now let us move on to the last session for the day that is the practice questions discussion session. Now this is a prelims question based on International Monetary Fund. The question asks which of the following reports are published by IMF. Now among these three options we discussed about one report today that is World Economic Outlook. So we can easily say that the final answer should contain two. That means we can eliminate option A and option D which does not contain option 2. Then remember that Global Financial Stability Report is published by International Monetary Fund. Okay, so the final answer to this question is option B 1 and 2 only. Now let us see one main question based on GS paper 2. 90-90-90 target based approach of ending AIDS menace is need of the hour. Discuss the global measures including measures by India in order to achieve the SDG of ending AIDS by 2030. Now here in this question the first part 
a sentence has been given so you might think that you have to spend more time on that sentence for substantiating whatever has been given in this statement but don't do that because that statement has been given only to distract you the original question is the second part that is discuss the global measures including measures by india in order to achieve the sdg of ending aids by 2030 so about the first half of the question you can say one or two statements only like what is 1990 90 target we discussed during our analysis that 1990 target is 90% of people living with hiv should know their hiv status then 90% of people who know their hiv positive status are accessing treatment and then 90% of people on treatment have suppressed viral loads that is their virus should have been suppressed then to the actual question you can mention about un aids which focuses on eliminating aids by placing people living with hiv and people affected by the virus at the decision making table and also by placing them at the designing delivering and monitoring of the aids response then you can say about uh, the un political declaration which is the declaration of commitment on hiv aids global crisis global action this is the first declaration which was uh, adopted in the year 2001 you can say how this declaration was a game changer as it had uh, priorities like uh, what to do to avoid the infection and uh, how to stop all the forms of hiv transmission from mother to child and to provide uh, treatment to the infected persons then you can uh, say about the global fund to fight aids tuberculosis and malaria which was created in 2002 which raises uh, manages money and invests uh, world's money to defeat these three diseases which also includes aids then among the indian measures you can say about the indian drug companies which reduced prices of aids drugs and uh, this has enabled many countries to afford the hiv aids treatment now in this question the question also says in order to achieve the sdg of ending aids by 2030 so you have to mention about the sdg goal which talks about the prevention and control of aids It has been mentioned in SDG goal number 3 that is ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all at all ages. Under this target 3.3 states by 2030 end the epidemics of AIDS, tuberculosis, malaria etc etc. So you can mention about this target. And you can also say that many other SDG goals can be interlinked to achieve this particular goal you can say even goal 1 is linked to hiv because goal 1 is related to poverty poverty can increase vulnerability to hiv infection so you can say unequal socio economic status of women compromises their ability to prevent hiv or to mitigate the impacts of aids then you can connect it with uh, sdg goal 4 also which is about ensuring quality education you can say globally about 7 in 10 adolescent girls and women in the age group 15 to 24 years do not have knowledge about hiv like this you can link hiv to most of the sdg goals such as you can link it to make cities safe and resilient you can link it to goal number 10 which is about reduce inequality you can uh, link it to goal number 8 which is about promote economic growth then you can also link it to goal number 5 which is about achieve gender equality etc you can also add your own view points to answer this question now let us see one another mains question this question is based on gs paper 3 The question states India needs to balance both the developmental needs as well as stress on water resources. Examine this statement. You can uh, answer this question by stating that India is the fastest growing economy in the world and uh, and you can also give some statistics like uh, India's GDP growth rate etc. Then you can say that the resources that are required for the developmental needs of India are huge. Then you can mention some of the important resources that are required for India's development. and then you can say that water is also one of the major resources then after this you can say about water crisis in india and you can uh, list the reasons for water crisis in india such as you can uh, say that most of the reasons uh, would be mad made like uh, over exploitation of water deforestation urbanization etc and you have to link all these points to the reasons and you have to say how it has led to the water stress then you can also explain the water stress in india with uh, industry wise example for this you can take our today's editorial analysis to give an example try to mention the points that we discussed during editorial analysis like uh, how the thermo power plants are leading to water stress across india 
then you can also suggest some measures to tackle this water stress you can mention some of the common suggestions that we analyzed during the editorial then to conclude the answer you can use the first statistics that we saw during our analysis that 18 percent of world's total population uses four percent of world's renewable water resources then you can try to conclude in a positive note that political will and citizens participation is required in conserving the water resources with this we have come to the end of today's analysis if you like the video don't forget to like comment and share and do subscribe to shankar ies academy youtube channel for more updates on civil service examination preparation